Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Rob is on vacation this week somewhere in Normandy. Woe is him. Such a terrible life he has. But I was able to recruit cousin Marco Papich back to the podcast. Uh, it's been a minute since Marco has been on because I've been traveling. He's been traveling. I actually I flew in to New Orleans today from Toronto from a from a speaking gig that I did earlier this week. Um, and as I say in the podcast, actually recording in the evening rather than my my usual morning slot. So this might get to you a little bit later than normal. Um, but super excited that Marco was able to come on to fill in for our weekly podcast and hoping to have Marco on a lot more going forward. Cousin, thank you for making the time. Uh, listeners, email me at jacob at cognitive.investments if you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything else you want to talk about. And that's really all I have. Enjoy. See you out there. All right, cousin, I, I don't actually remember the last time you were on the podcast. Do you remember what the last time was and what we talked about? <laughs> I don't. I don't. But it probably involved a lot of things, and then we ended with basketball. Yeah, and we were probably correct about everything that we predicted. I know I wasn't correct about my basketball takes, because I remember last year I predicted a Milwaukee-New Orleans NBA Finals, and that uh, that did not pan out. <laughs> New Orleans. <laughs> I'm not surprised it panned out well, too. This is also weird for me, listeners. Listeners, usually you catch me like it's early in the morning. I've just dropped my daughter off at daycare or something. I'm on like my second cup of coffee and I'm rolling today, recording at 7 p.m. Central Time. So I actually just gave Annie a bath. I've like had some, you know, I've had dinner. I'm sort of winding down. So I'm having to rev up the machine here. I hope I'm appropriately energetic. I'll, I'll rely on you, Marco, to crack the whip if I start looking like I'm fading at all. <laughs> Ooh, that's hard, man. It's 5 p.m., you know, like been up for a long time. So this is going to be a subdued, less hyperbolic Marco. I don't know how we're going to deal with Like more measured, wow. like contemplative, thinking about both sides of the argument. You know, that's usually not, that's not what I'm here for, quite frankly. And so- yeah. I don't know how I should we just should we just stop right now and wait we until should just anyway, pack no. it in we should just pack it in <laughs> um we we chatted this week on on real vision and um it was funny I I knew going into the call that I was going to agree with you on basically everything so I spent like my hour of prep beforehand being like what are the ways that I can disagree with Marco and, and try to push his buttons on this thing and I think I did an okay job I think it was kind of cool yeah, but um, I thought we might start um, where we picked up there, which is, you know, the, the biggest geopolitical thing in the world, much to my chagrin. I, I keep joking about this in front of audiences. The, the joy of our job is that we don't normally have to deal with the dumpster fire that is American politics, but it's the U.S. election. And um, I, I don't know if you feel this way. I Going in January, I felt like I had a really good sense of where things were going. Like I thought inflation was going to surprise the upside. I thought that was going to put pressure on Biden. I thought U.S.-China ties were going to get better. Like things have sort of happened sort of the way I thought. And now that we're here, I feel completely uncertain about what's going to happen next. Like I don't I don't understand maybe where we go from here. Um, so with that, with that preamble, just, uh, I don't know, tell me what you're thinking about for the rest of the year. Are you surprised at where we are right now? And, and how do you think this is all leading up to the election. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised. You know, uh, I guess I am surprised uh, perhaps by the continued resiliency of the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. um, just because the fact is there's like really not a single iota of evidence except wages rolling over pretty significantly. But other than that, uh, the U.S. economy is very, very robust. And of course, I've been in the camp of being maniacally bullish about the U.S. economy really since middle of 2022, um, bullish stocks since middle of 2022. My uh, S&P 500 target for this year is 5,500, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so it's it's not that I'm bearish or that I was expecting a recession, but I did think that the Fed's job would be made easier with some weak prints somewhere, somehow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, and yeah, like I, I also expected inflation to be sticky. That's fine. But like they can deal with sticky inflation, justify it, say it's transitory, whatever, and then point to like, oh, well, look at what happened to the ISM print or what happened with, you know, jolts or something. And they haven't really been able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's uh, complicating the situation. Now, of course, they never had any evidence to begin with to pivot in the first place. And so, like, let's just remind ourselves of that. Like, it's not like inflation was not above target. It's not like growth was rolling over in December when they told us they were going to pivot to cuts. 
and in March, where they tripled down on the three cuts. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they had a, they they could have said two. Nobody would have faulted them, right? Already, everyone was saying like, "Hey guys, there's no real evidence that you should cut." No, 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 no. They stuck to three in March, and I think that's just a vindication that they are political. They are behind the curve. You cannot explain it in any macroeconomic like sense and so now they are in a bind now they're in a corner and now they're probably going to have to like pivot towards like oh well, let's wait and see if the, the damage is done you're behind the curve you should have probably hiked rates you know in q1 uh you've missed that boat and so you know it is what it is um do you do you think there's any chance they hike now like do you think there's any chance they realize the mistake and they try and stamp on it or do you think that the the, the horse is already out of the barn I think uh, they're going to try to play it out. I mean, I think the most, if you are in the hike camp, uh, you, I think, given my framework, which I think was correct for the last six months, given the framework that I think they are political, I think they hike like in November, if they do hike. And until then, they just run it up. You know, they just run it up. November what? Because that actually matters. <laughs> no, no, I mean... Um, you know, like they would do it after the election for December. The meeting, I believe, is oh, okay. in December. Um, and yeah, not in November. So in December. Like if they were to hike, I'm open to that possibility, but I don't think there's really any chance they hike before the election. And and I mean, think about it. It would require more than just sticky inflation for them to hike. And the only way that I can see a reversal of inflation, first of all, demanding the U.S. is going to trend lower. It just, I mean, again, mm -hmm. I'm the guy who said San Francisco Fed is like wrong we're not going to run out of excess savings. At least not when they thought. But we are now running out of excess savings. You know, like it was just, they were just early. God bless them. Uh, their math was just wrong. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that wages are rolling over. The stimulus checks from 2020, 2021 have whittled down. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very difficult to imagine a scenario where inflation is endogenous and sui generis. So the only way that I can see inflation going back up is if you have an exogenous factor such as an oil shock, and I do think they will look through that, and Israel and Iran handed them a ready-made excuse for that. And so if inflation is merely sticky, moving sideways, um, or if it's rising because of exogenous factors, I think they'll look through all of that until December. Because again, to me, the number one issue is the U.S. election. That's the black hole of macro. It bends time and space around it. As I said on Real Vision, you know, like to me, this really matters. It's why we're our, where we are in the S and P five hundred. It's why everything is the way it is in the world in general. But I don't know if I agree with you about the about the oil point there, or the or what Iran gave to the administration because. I, I gave myself a pat on the back about inflation and U.S.-China relations and everything else at the beginning. I was wrong about energy prices. I thought natural gas was going to go up in the first quarter. I certainly didn't think oil was going to be in the doldrums. And I mean, we had Iran striking Israeli territory, and we're going to, I mean, barring something absolutely insane happening tomorrow, we're going to close down on the week for Brent crude. Um, that That's somewhat remarkable. I guess, I mean, is that... Is that something to the inflation camp that not even a you know a Middle East crisis can send the price of oil upwards? Maybe maybe there's something there in that, but I don't. And you know, also pair it with the news that the U.S. is um, reimposing those sanctions on Venezuela, like and oil still hanging out at eighty a barrel. I don't know. So, so just to be clear, you asked me if the next move is a high. Yeah. Right. So I wasn't. I'm. I'm. Let's say I'm directionally agnostic about oil. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that if oil were to go up, if inflation goes up because of energy prices, I think they will look through it because they can ascribe it to geopolitics. But and, and the other thing is that energy prices have gone up significantly. So we hit bottom on Brent at $75, and ironically, two months into the Israel-Gaza war. <laughs> but then we did go above 90, right? So like yeah. uh, oil prices are significantly up. Uh, it's almost a 20% move. So now since Iran-Israel uh, conflict, they haven't gone. And that's also, and by the way, that's also something that we need to really consider. I think that um, a lot of folks who came out and said after their December pivot and March pivot, a lot of folks who said, hey, listen, this pivot makes no sense. They're going to have to eat their words about cuts. 
they were correct. They were correct. But I think the move now is to go the other way because I don't think these inflation prints are sustainable. I don't mm. see rent prices going up in the US. There's a slew of indicators suggesting that rent component of inflation will go down. And the other issue is exactly what you just said about energy. You know, if energy can't go up now, nah, after missiles have gone to Israel, and if there is more, if this reveals massive downside risk to energy prices, like, Jacob, you know what's going to happen? Their view, their pivot, which was infinitely political, will grow <laughs> into itself. It will grow into itself. You know, it will mature nicely. And in four or five months, they'll be like, see, we told you. We got some weakness. CPI is rolling over. So in other words, like, yes, I think uh, making the call that inflation was going to surprise the outside is a great call. It hasn't affected their thinking, and it may very well pass. Mm -hmm. Unless we get a move in energy prices and other things, you know? So like, that's where the, I think the Israel-Iran uh, um, situation, even though we may want to dismiss it, and I think both of you, you and I have that kind of like sanguine view on it, I think it's an incredibly important macro signal. I've been long oil since early February. That's been a very nice trade. And I was just talking to a very sophisticated hedge fund that knows how to trade energy. And they were telling me like, look, Marco, like when something like this happens and the asset doesn't move the way it should, you have to pause and think about it. And I remember, you know, like when Russia invaded Ukraine, a lot of folks wanted to be long bonds. Yeah. They didn't really rally. They actually sold off. Um, I'll give you another example. You remember well, May 2014, ISIS mm -hmm. takes over Mosul, the second largest city of Iraq, falls. They're on their way to Baghdad, and oil doesn't even budge. And you're just like, yeah. wait a minute. You know, I get goosebumps just saying this to you. Iran just launched missiles at Israel. You could just say, well, the market is stupid. Well, the market is complacent. Well, all these traders, what do they know about geopolitics? Or you could say like, oh my God oil is about to turn. And if oil turns, then you got to ask yourself about the strength of the U.S. economy. Why is oil turning? In, in You know, look right now. Why? Is the 10-year yield then appropriately at 4.6, 4.7? Is that going to come down? Is growth going to trend lower? And at that point, the Fed talking about cuts isn't so silly anymore. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, uh, I don't know if you saw this, the Wall Street Journal today had had a report that the U.S. is, is doing another Hail Mary for a Saudi-Israel normalization deal as part of <laughs> resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I, I literally just tweeted before we got on, like, is there a president for dummies handbook that says during the last six months of a president of a Democratic presidency, you go for an impossible deal in the Middle East? But that the only reason like I a, say... This sounds like Malik uh, Monk of geopolitics, you know, like your <laughs> national confidence guy. Bring in Malik Hawk. We're down by 17 points. <laughs> he's gonna, he's just gonna shoot threes and like this one in ten chance. He just hits five in a row. And literally 12 of our listeners understood that. And we can move on. Well, I, I think that's an insult to Malik Monk. I really think it's more of a to 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 cite one of your boys. I think it's more of a Nick Young, like throwing Oof. up the shots and turning to the side, thinking it went in Cam and then it didn't go in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah no, that's good. That's good. Well done. Well done. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here for niche uh, geopolitical basketball analogies. If, if that was a currency, boy, would I be extremely wealthy. Um, yeah. But I, I, I bring that up to say, maybe if Iran hit Saudi Arabia, we'd be talking about it. Because, you know, Israel's not an oil producer. They're not dragging the United States into the conflict. So maybe the Rubicon that would have to be crossed would be the Houthis hitting Saudi oil infrastructure again or something like that. And if I can't believe the Saudis are actually going for this in a meaningful way, but if they are like flirting with some kind of deal, like maybe Iran will get pissed off at them and the understanding between the two sides will, but you know, I'm like now really stretching to try and find some way to, to pull higher oil prices. No, you're totally right. Business. But you know what? But, but I think Jacob, like uh, since we're talking about Israel, Iran, like let's go right into it. I mean, mm -hmm. Look, I think um, I think what's underestimated, and I think you've probably heard me talk about this, and uh, I think I mentioned it when you and I were together a couple of days ago, but like Iran-Saudi Arabia deal is really important. It's the only thing that explains lack of geopolitical risk premium in the markets. Although, you know, some investment banks like Goldman Sachs suggest there's 5 to $10 of premium. Uh, fine, whatever. I think it's on the lower end. Why? 
precisely because the Houthis could very easily, I mean, let's just be very clear, very easily attack north as they do south. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they did. In 2022, they attacked the Abu Dhabi airport. In 2019, they struck Saudi facilities. Mm -hmm. So clearly the Saudi-Iran deal is holding, and we need to understand the intricacies of that deal because we have to ask ourselves why wouldn't Iran strike facilities, right? Like, that's your question. Like, why? And I think what is being missed here is just how much goodies Iran got. Saudi Arabia basically ceded control of Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, the crown jewel of the Middle East, to Iraq. That is what really is holding this together. I mean, they pulled support for Muqtada al-Sadr, who handed mm -hmm. over political control to various Iran-linked Shia militias and parties. Bashar al-Assad came to that November summit in Riyadh. Bashar al-Assad is now recognized as the leader of Syria by the Saudis. And of course, there's, you know, a nominal peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. So this is an incredible gain for Iran, which is obsessed with having standoff distance with its rivals. So why did Saudi Arabia make this deal? I think there's two reasons Saudi Arabia. So I don't think Iran abrogates this deal for anything. It's a historical mm -hmm. achievement for Tehran. For Saudi Arabia, I think if they're comfortable with their military capabilities now. I think the Yemen war illustrated to them and their rivals that they're more than capable of conducting strikes and that, uh, you know, they have a very functional military. They've spent a lot of money on it. And the second thing that they feel comfortable with is that they're focused on economic development. That's all they care about. They want everything from Ronaldo to industrialization to happen, you know, and that's their priority one through hundred. And they just don't want to deal with Sunni Shia conflict. They're like, whatever, you know, Iran, you want Syria? Sure, whatever. What does the winner get? Like, go have at it. Um, and so that's what's holding this entire region in place. That dynamic. It's not Israel, Saudi Arabia. It's not the Abraham Accords. It's not China. It's not the U.S. It's the fact that Iran and Saudi Arabia somehow found equilibrium. Well, do you think that means that that these like American reports about Saudi Arabia considering this, it's just nonsense? Do you think they're trying to cajole Saudi Arabia into some sort of normalization deal? Or because the the rumor is that Saudi Arabia wants some kind of U.S. security guarantee that the price for normalization will be, you know, a, an iron like a treaty level sort of Philippines level, South Korea level sort of defense treaty with the United States. Which, if they're ceding all of the strategic territory, I guess you can sort of get there in the abstract. But I don't know. Do you think that's what they want? So yes, I do, and I think they also. There were rumors a couple of uh, months ago, or maybe a year ago, there were rumors that they also wanted nuclear uh, technology transfer, like the yeah. one that India got from the U.S. Yeah, I you know, kind that. of civilian, but like. <laughs> You know, not yeah, really. Yeah, so, yeah n nonsense. Like Iran, you can't have nukes. But Saudi Arabia, like here, here's the red carpet for yes. civilian nuclear weapons. Give me a break. But, but like, listen, if I was running Saudi Arabia, I would, I would say, listen, listen. It's an absolute joke that the U.S. is not going to defend us in a war. This whole nonsense that America is like independent with energy. Yes, it is. But it doesn't mean the U.S. is just going to like wantonly ignore 11 million exported oil barrels because it will crash the global economy. So if I'm running Saudi Arabia, I'm like, don't defend me. You know, let's see how that goes. <laughs> Sip of my, uh, my coffee. Like, yeah, this... you do. As, if, if I was president of the United States, I would call that bluff, but I'm not it. president of the United States. But again, like, and then what? <laughs> and then what? The dollar goes to the roof and your economy goes to shit. Like WTI price is not going to go up with the brand. Well, I'm not sure. That, no, then then you just kick in some old some old laws on the books to prevent exports, and you keep the price of energy down. And also, relative to other economies in the world, the United States will do just fine. And maybe before you do this, you should make amends with Venezuela, and you're gonna you're also gonna become the security guarantor of Guyana, which has a fairy tale discovery. Yeah, down but we're there talking five years. We're talking yeah. five, ten years. We're talking five, even Venezuela. You're talking five, ten years. Look, U.S. economy is in a in a recession. There's no way to avoid. They're just like, and it's not like that like exports shutting down exports would keep the wti prices down there's all all sorts of ways in which prices would seep out the dollar would go through the roof u.s exports would collapse yeah it's only 10 percent of gdp but it's still 10 percent of gdp u.s would do uh, better relative to the rest of the world but the guy with a pink slip in detroit 
doesn't care about the fact that like, oh, well, I'm winning because over there in Germany, they're starving, you know? So look, my point here is that it's, I think Saudi Arabia will continue to play hardball. So I don't think they give Biden a gift unless Biden pays a lot for it, you know? Yeah. Well, and this is actually a good segue to how we started this conversation, or at least the, you know, the U.S. election portion of it, which is, um, I was sort of thinking that if you keep on getting hotter inflation prints, just every hotter print brings Donald Trump that much closer to the White House. But yeah. part of what you're saying is, well, if you're not getting the hotter prints, and let's let's say that oil not rising as a result of the Middle East crisis tells us that something is wrong and the economy is going to roll over and the Fed's going to start looking, if, if the Fed looks right in four to five months that the economy is weakening, that's also not very good for Biden. That tells you the economy sucks. So he's kind of... Like, how does he, is there any hope for him at this point? Because he, he's down in the swing states. It sounds like every scenario leads to he sucks on the economy. Just to be clear, just to be clear, um, I'm pointing out the kind of uh, other side of this argument. As I said, I'm the contemplative Marco, uh, not okay. the hyperbolic Marco. So I don't have a high conviction view on like what happens with inflation over the next six months. But I, I do want to point out that Iran, Israel, not moving oil prices. Hmm. But to go back to this Biden point, you know, like, What's good for Biden? I don't know. I don't know, Jacob, because all I know is that economic uh, expectations by consumers, consumer sentiment is through the roof positive, through the roof. Mm -hmm. CEO, CEOs are finally not suicidal anymore. <laughs> CEO confidence is finally in positive territory as well. Everybody in the United States of America loves what's going on. And yet, Joe Biden hasn't seen any movement in polls. It's alligator draws charts. You know, when charts basically diverge, normally your presidential approval rating does correlate with consumer sentiment, with CEO sentiment, and all this improvement in economic sentiment since the 2023 year when everybody expected a recession hasn't done anything for Joe Biden. And so I don't know how to answer your question. Like, I don't know what's positive for him. You know what I mean? Like, because clearly the public at least from sentiment data, is feeling better about things, but it's not being articulated into Joe Biden's approval rating. Now, that said, as you know, Trump is also not like a favorable candidate. He's got a very high unfavorability unfa rating. The polls are very tight. So what I would say to you, Jacob, is that their only chance, their only chance of winning for the Democrats, I think, is to ensure that there isn't a recession. Yes, Stick inflation sucks, but raising rates and causing like potentially recessionary outcomes, I do think is worse. Why? Because their only chance is that November 4th, no, November 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th, however many undecideds there are in those four days, there's not going to be many. We agree. But they're going to be meaningful given how close the elections are in these mm -hmm. swing states. The only chance is that if you're still an undecided voter in the United States of America between Donald Trump and, Jay, and Joe Biden at that point, if you're still undecided, you go to the voting booth and you're like, eh, you know what? Like unemployment is at like 3.8. Like, yeah, inflation is sticking, but like, do I really want to like just blow everything up with the anti establishment option? That is, I think, Joe Biden's. Um, hope at this point it's that eight out of ten undecided swing not for him not for him for the incumbent for the continuation of the baseline because mm -hmm. you know it, it's not it could be a lot worse and i or think I, that that's... i guess also for for rfk jr <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that's good or bad for joe i mean i think that's it that's the only plan the undecided swing eight Eight out of ten for Joe Biden at the end, uh, because there isn't a recession, because the economy is humming, and because indicators are moving in the right direction. Yeah. I don't see how else they move. I mean, look, what I'm saying, this isn't like a pro Joe Biden argument. I'm simply, I mean, it's actually an anti Joe Biden argument because I don't know how to answer your question. You're asking me what's better for them. I don't think they have, like, this is as Goldilocks as it gets. I mean, yeah, inflation could be lower, but come on, like, it's it's not at six percent. You know, inflation mm -hmm. has come down significantly, and inflation coming down is important. Why? Because it allowed real wages to skyrocket. As CPI goes down, real wages go up. And so, you know, uh, if the consumers are still not choosing, if the voters are still not choosing Joe Biden at this point, 
are you telling me that going from three and a half percent CPI to two percent is going to make a difference? Yeah, that's crazy. Normal human beings can't assess the difference between three and a half and two percent inflation. Yeah. Um, I hate when people ask me who's going to win the election, so I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going to ask you your scenarios. So what is your scenario for the 12 months after Biden wins? And what's your scenario for the 12 months after Trump wins from sort of an economic markets perspective? I don't know, man. That's a long time. That's two years. Oh, that's like one and a half years from now, you know? It is. That's why they right. pay us the big bucks, my friend. <laughs> I want to nibble at that answer. Um, look, um, a lot of things are Bayesian in that, like, we need to know how Donald Trump reacts to the market's reaction to his presidency. Uh, I don't think there's anything really interesting with Joe Biden, so I'm just going to stick to the Trump scenario because it's cooler. Yeah. It's, it's more, more disruptive, fun. too. It's more disruptive, well, it's... yeah. And I have a very controversial view. I wrote a piece whose title was Donald Trump, colon, Defender of Globalization and World Peace? Question mark. <laughs> So I Tell actually don't, yeah, I actually don't think that Donald Trump will be uh, disruptive on trade. We can disagree on that. that. That's fine. I don't think he will be disruptive on uh, geopolitics either. I actually think a lot of outstanding issues get resolved the day he shows up. He's going to come, he's going to tell Zelensky the truth, which is like, the war is over. You need to focus on other things. You're not reconquering these territories anytime soon. So like things like that are going to happen with Donald Trump on the geopolitical front, and I don't think that's something that investors should fear. Um, the the thing where I think Donald Trump will be disruptive is that I think that he's the Liz Truss of America, hmm. and the bond market is going to lose its mind. Uh, when he was elected president in November of 2016, the correct call wasn't to be long equities. Like, yeah, that happened. The correct call was to be short duration because the 10-year yield absolutely exploded. And then the 10-year yield kind of went sideways and bonds rallied throughout 2017 because Republicans kept trying to repeal Obamacare instead <laughs> of fulfilling market expectations of, of you know, basically fiscal stimulus. And then they did pass the job tax cuts and um, the 2017 Jobs and Tax Cuts Act, which was a surprise to 99 of 100 investors. Why? Because everyone in this industry really struggles analyzing politics because they're biased. And let me say, let, let me tell you exactly what I mean. In 2017, when I was traveling from, you know, Sacramento to Stockholm, every investor, liberal, said Republicans are incompetent. They will not pass tax cuts. Look at what they're doing with Obamacare. Conservatives told me, no, 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 they're competent. They will pass, but it will be revenue neutral, to which I, of course, go fawn. <laughs> So we got the 2017 uh, deal, which was a trillion dollar unnecessary fiscal stimulus at the end of this cycle. And the 10 year yield went from one and a half percent after Brexit to 3%. Now, you know why nobody remembers this story? Because nobody cared. Stocks yeah. and bonds were negatively correlated, and we were, and they were negatively correlated because there was no growth and there was no inflation. Donald Trump was God's retribution for austerity. He was the mean reversion ferret. You know, he was like how we ended the secular stagnation. And so, yeah, we needed growth. So, boom, equities loved it. Well, we're starting his new presidency at what? 10-year yield of, I don't know, between 4 and 5% by November, right? I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. And the market will be correct to assume that he will not do austerity because he doesn't really mean it. And that he will pursue tax cuts that will not be paid for. And so what I expect on November 6th, and that's why my S&P 500 target that I mentioned earlier, 5,500, was for November 5th, not December 31st, mm -hmm. just to be clear. I expect on November 6th, the same thing to happen. Bonds will sell off, except this time in an environment where bonds and equities are positively correlated. And that sell-off will cause an epic stock market crash. Now, now, Trump supporters tell me, Marco, your mathematical logic is not bad. I see where you're going. But please do me a favor. Please tell me. This is actually, this is a potentially the next very high placed member of the Trump administration. Literally said this to me. I don't disagree with your logic. However, technically, it won't be the Trump bond market, right? 
I was like, why is that? Well, he doesn't really become the president until January 20th. So clearly you should call it the Biden bond market, right? Mm. And I was like, oh my God, it's going to happen. Now, this is why it's difficult for me to forecast like a year and a half because then you and I, Jacob, have to get put on our thinking cap and assign probabilities to what will Donald Trump do at that point. Will he do the Bill Clinton thing from 94 where Bill Clinton, who by the way, ran as a populist, he didn't run as a third way liberal Tony Blair. Look, no, hell no. He was a populist from Arkansas. Give me the Cold War dividend, I'll give it to the public. And then you got the bond market riot in 94 and he sat down with Gingrich and of course consolidated budget. So we could have that outcome. And I, I, I do think Donald Trump is capable of doing that. Like if he sniffs out that there's a true economic danger to the United States of America and that the media voter truly does want austerity, boom, like this, he'll move the party. That's his superpower. He can sniff out where the media voter is. But there is also the other alternative where Donald Trump just says, look, I want the BOJ special. I'm not going to let bond vigilantes. Bond, who? Bond traders? I steal their, restu- their restaurant reservations in Manhattan restaurant. <laughs> Screw those guys. I want you to anchor the 10-year yield. And so I think that's the biggest thing to me. I mean, how does the bond market react to the fact that Donald Trump is, and I don't mean this pejoratively, I mean, he just is an economic populist. And again, the world needed that in 2016. I'm not sure it needs it in 2024, just because we have plenty of growth in inflation. Yeah, I'm I'm really not sure that the Clinton comparison holds water. And I I don't want to, again, like I I don't care to air my personal views on this podcast. So what I'm about to say is not an indication of what I think one way or another about um, the election. But Bill Clinton, for all of his flaws, and he had many of them, was maybe the smartest person to ever be in the White House. I mean, he had a next level brain. You talk to people that were around him, how well read he was, his memory, a Rhodes Scholar. I mean, like he wasn't just a political chameleon. He could exist in any intellectual environment and be the smartest person in the room. Um, Donald Trump is not that. He he certainly, you're right, has a genius in figuring out where the mob is going and in directing the mob into certain directions. But he feels much more like the the American political figure I've always used to compare him to is Huey Long. And we don't we don't get to see what happened if Huey Long got elected because somebody gunned Huey Long down before he could get into a real position of power. But so all I really have to go on is Robert Penn Warren's book, All the King's Men, which is really what started my love affair with politics, um, to get a sort of glimpse into what would have happened. And like at least if 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 Robert Penn Warren did the job right, like like the 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 populist who gets into power doesn't do what you're talking about. He probably just kind of sinks into his own power and starts, you know, appointing sycophants and appointing loyalists and making sure that he can never lose and stuff like that. So, I don't know. I I would pick at at that comparison a little so bit. You, so you, so you would no. But all I'm saying is there's two options. There's the Bill Clinton outcome, and then there's the BOJ anchor that yield. But right. So yeah. you're 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 weighing this the latter higher. You know, yeah, um, I, I don't see how the bill, I, the bill, like if I'm putting on my thinking cap and trying to put myself into the shoes of Trump, November 6th, he wins. I don't think the Bill Clinton option even comes to his mind. I don't think he goes there in his head. I mean, in that case, if I'm right, then the dollar's going to fall in mess. Well, the, the other thing I wanted to pick out of what you said, and this was the one, you know, I, I was contrarian with you a lot in Real Vision, but the one place where I really differed was because I'm a little bit more afraid of the Trump scenario from both a trade and from a geopolitical um, perspective. And I'm having a little trouble squaring. So how, how is this the most important thing happening geopolitically this year? But you don't think there's going to be a lot of geopolitical change meaningfully with Ukraine if it happens, or let's say Venezuela, which the Trump administration tried to overthrow in a sort of its own Bay of Pigs situation. What about South Korea? He's talked about pulling all the troops out of South Korea, completely messing up the US, Japan, South Korea thing that Biden has done. One of, I think, Biden's least talked about successes. What happens to Germany? I imagine that if you get Trump 2.0, I expect to, to hear about the Teutonic Knights marching in the forests and new panzer divisions like getting authorized immediately in a way that they're not going to right now. All of these feel like big geopolitical impacts to me. Tell me why I shouldn't be worried about these things. Look, the reason that I think that the U.S. election is the most important macro theme, and I'm going to stick to my view that the Fed was political, is because I believe that American establishment elites are absolutely horrified of a future of a Trump 2.0 presidency. 
Mm-hmm. And so the, the it's all hands on deck. It's like Jean-Marie Le Pen. It's not Marie Le Pen. It's her dad. You know, it's like the entire infrastructure of a country is basically turning towards ensuring that this populist anti-establishment figure doesn't win. And I think that's what is relevant. Like that is what's causing Janet Yellen, Jay Powell, Joe Biden. That's this is the election put bull market. That's that's the way I mean. Now, is Donald Trump going to be? Uh, I think he's simply on the geopolitical front. I and on trade front, I think he's going to. Like the trend is already clear. You know, I think the trend is already clear. He already established a trend on trade. Uh, the problem with trade, Jacob, is that he opened up this genie from the bottle that we can be protectionist. And the irony is that the Democrats cannot put the genie back into the bottle. No, they don't want to. They don't want to either. But I also think that they cannot. He can. He can. They cannot. And this is because if they do, they will be accused of being pro-China or weak on trade or whatever. So you had Jake Sullivan give a speech to the Brookings Institute, which was basically a sanitized version of Trump's, you know, um, rhetoric. It was just like sanitized for CFR cocktail parties so that they don't spit out their martinis. But it was like Jake Sullivan sold us this idea, middle class, uh, foreign policy for the middle class. If you read that speech, I mean, I don't see any daylight between that and Trump. I mean, I'm sure that Sullivan would disagree with me, and that's just too bad. I disagree with him massively. And so do America's partners. And the problem is that, look, you can say whatever you want about phase one deal or USMCA, and I probably agree with all of it. But at least Trump made deals. Biden hasn't concluded a single free trade deal. He hasn't even attempted them. And he's now using tariffs against Chinese steel and aluminum as an election campaign promise. So where I see Donald, I see Donald Trump as the only human being in the United States of America out of 400 million people who can conclude trade deals. Because no one's going to accuse him of being weak on trade. No one's going to accuse him of being, um, you know, even though he probably is weak on trade. Because if you look at the USMCA deal, it didn't actually, I mean, that's a deal that Canada won, in my view. And if you look at the phase one deal, as you pointed out before yourself, like it didn't really do much uh, for um, from the perspective of China. I mean, they didn't accomplish all those positions. But nonetheless, he does get deals done. And that's because he has the political capital domestically to do that. On the geopolitical front, um, and I think he will. I mean, I think he will threaten tariffs. He may even increase them in the near term. Uh, but I think that his intention is to conclude deals. And this is what I brought up when we had the last conversation. Um, you know, he pivoted on TikTok. He talked to Ohio uh, at an Ohio uh, speech. He said, I'll bring Chinese EVs to Ohio. Can you imagine if Joe Biden had said the same thing? <laughs> You know, like, I mean, he would have been criticized. Nobody even picked up that speech that Trump made because Trump is allowed to conclude a trade deal with China. Biden isn't. And that's unfair, but it also makes Democrats actually more dangerous from a global stability perspective because they are weaker domestically and they don't have as much maneuvering room. It's the old adage that only Nixon could go to China. Similarly, only Trump can conclude trade deals with China. I'm going to stop there, so we so we can we can do yeah. the geopolitics later. Let's just stick to trade. Yeah, yeah, no, let, let, let's do that because I mean, I I like the Nixon China Trump trade comparison. That's an <laughs> elegant comparison, um, but I, I have I'll, I'll problematize it a little bit for you. Number one, you're right that Biden hasn't really concluded any deals, and I was somebody who, I believe, when he um, he still had some fast track authority for the first six or eight months, I think, of his presidency, where if he wanted to go after the TPP and try and re-engage, he probably could have legally uh, and forced it through. And he made the same mistake that Obama did with healthcare. He, you know, pussyfooted around. It's funny because he got accused of being hard left and all this other stuff. He actually, like, probably pulled some of his punches on some of the things that he would have felt sort of most deeply about. But so he didn't pursue TPP. But, but... I do think he did some things that maybe they're not trade deals. Maybe he doesn't have to claim, he doesn't get to claim credit as for doing trade deals, but he ended the budding Europe-US trade war, which Trump started. I mean, he, he solved the Airbus-Boeing thing. He put, the, he put the genie back in the bottle when it came to the transatlantic relationship, and that has paid dividends for years going forward. He got Japan and South Korea to be friends with, another, with one another again. Not just intelligence sharing, but got Japan to put 
South Korea back on that whitelist or whatever, so the trade between those two countries could go back to be normal. They, it stopped, uh, I think, what, 2019 was when that mini trade war started out. And a free trade deal with India is sort of, it's the white whale for everyone. I don't think Modi's going to give it to anyone. But you have had serious working groups between the United States and India on semiconductors, on different types of strategic technologies, and U.S. companies running around India, and lots of incentives and things happening for U.S. companies to go into India and things like that. So he may not have a trade deal to his name, and he has certainly bought into um, protectionism, like in that sense, the Bernie wing of the party one it sort of absorbed like democratic trade policy and that's what it is now in the same way that trump populism absorbed republican trade policy so now all the free trade liberals and conservatives are just like you know going to clubs like don't you remember the good days in the 90s where we could all like think about this stuff um so i i'm with you on like biden doesn't have deals to his names but i think he was actually trying to do things and he has some successes whereas trump I mean, I don't, maybe, maybe I'm not giving him enough credit. Maybe he'll do the Nixon maneuver that you're talking about. But I, you know, he's talking about 60% tariffs on China and 10% tariffs on everybody else. Let's say I put that to the side and say that's nonsense. It's a negotiating tactic. It's classic, classic Trump hyperbole. Let's take the one part that I think is not hyperbole because he certainly is mad at China about the phase one trade deal and for them not li living up to it. And he must be reading all these articles about how. Mexico has surpassed China as the biggest trade partner for the United States, for the most part, because Chinese exports are going through Mexico now into the United States. And if you sure. go, yeah, trademark, exactly. And if you go on top of all of that with Mexico, he's losing AMLO, who he he was buddies with AMLO. AMLO gave him some amulets to ward off like evil spirits and stuff. I don't think Claudia Scheinbaum is going to be giving him any amulets or that the relationship is going to be that cozy. On top of it, and listeners, like go to Trump's campaign website and, and look at this page. It is the cojones on this guy. He has declared war on Mexico's drug cartels. Like already Trump has declared war on the drug cartels. And like I don't think he's bluffing when he says he wants to deploy the U.S. military into Mexico to go after these cartels. I think he's very brave for even uttering any of those words in sort of the same sentence, let alone putting them on a campaign website. Um, but like, just let's just talk about USMCA, which it turns out was probably not that good a deal for the United States, the deal that Trump made. And it allowed all of these Chinese things to come into the United States from Mexico. And Canada's winning all these dispute mechanisms. I go hang out with farmers and they're like, can you believe Canada won that dispute mechanism? And I'm like, yeah, I, I paid attention to the deal maker and what he was doing. So anyway, I threw a bunch at you, but I'll let you take it from there. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, America First Institute in DC, which is his much more than the Heritage Institute. It's really the America First Institute that's uh, planning his second presidency. You know, it doesn't have much on trade, but when they talk about the phase one deal with China, they praise it. When they talk about USMCA, they praise the labor <laughs> protections, even though that was Canada that asked for them and Trump opposed them. Yeah. Um, and listen, <laughs> again, like, yeah, he's talking about 60% tariffs in China, but then he tells Ohio manufacturing workers that he's going to bring Chinese EVs to the U.S., and so, um, you know, like, I mean, it's all rhetoric, you know, and, and let's, let's go back and just look at Trump. There's, I joked with clients, just seven steps of maximum pressure. And it's always the same, whether it's North Korea, whether it's poor Justin Trudeau, whether it's, you know, Xi Jinping, it's always exactly the same. You, you set your sights for the moon. I mean, just look at Lighthizer's opening salvo in the USMCA yeah. negotiations. The U.S. didn't get any of that. You set your sights for the moon, then you punch someone in the mouth, you whip out your big button, then you start negotiating, then you leave the bride at the altar. Always, every single time Trump did this. Always, 11th hour, the the, the Singapore summit with North Koreans is off. Uh, flying from the G7 summit from Quebec, Justin Trudeau's mean. Uh, Announcing 10% increase in tariffs in the summer of 2018. With Twitter, Lighthizer wasn't even informed. <laughs> and then everybody scrambles, including the White House, including Trump officials who were so in into the negotiations. They get sad. And then she brings them all together and makes a deal. Last concession makes him look like a winner, even though he got nothing close to the original thing. So if you're a Trump detractor, you can point to the eventual deal and say, ah, you didn't get what you wanted, but if you're a Trump supporter, you can say, yeah, but he got a deal. You know, and he got it through the domestic political machine where he looks tough. 
And I think that's, so again, it's, this isn't about Joe Biden versus Trump. All I'm saying, and if you're, if you're a Democratic Party supporter, you, I will concede this is unfair. It is unfair. It's unfair. It's unfair that poor Democrats have to adopt Trump's protectionism and get nothing for it because they cannot pass a single thing through Congress or through the court of public opinion. It's unfair that Trump can, but he can and he will. I, I think he will ultimately do that. Um, no, you know, we can disagree with this and it'll be fun. Let's see what happens. The question for investors is why does it matter? And, and this is Jacob where I think it's interesting. You know, I, I, I visited um, um, a, a lot of really kind of large, sophisticated hedge funds in New York they listen to my bomb thesis. They listen to my 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 idea. Well, maybe he will do yield curve control. Dollar goes down. The number one trade from a currency perspective for a lot of hedge funds is that Trump is clearly dollar positive because of tariffs. And this is what mm. I would reject that view. I think empirically it's very difficult to assign positive move to the dollar from the 2018 tariffs. And my argument has been like, look, the economy, global economy was going down because China was going down. So you and I, we might be right, we might be wrong. I don't know. Like, it'll be fun to watch, like, what Trump does. I think he'll be right in the short term. Like, you know, he will punch people in the mouth. He'll use the tariffs. And then he'll start negotiating. Um, I don't know if the dollar really moves. Maybe there's a knee-jerk move because everybody thinks. Again, every hedge fund I talk to is basically like, no, 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 Marco, like, tariffs matter. I don't think so. But whatever, I'm just one guy. It'll be interesting to see dollar's reaction in 2025. And it'll be interesting what's more important. Uh, bond sell yeah, it, moderate policy or trade it's funny where, where i find myself with you is um because i'm sort of halfway there with you but my first thoughts don't go to the dollar i'm, I'm a little um less developed in this theory than you are with yours but and i sort of alluded to on real vision I'm, I'm doing the research right now but i think everybody assumes that, that the tariffs are going to be inflationary even if they're only inflationary for a brief time period and maybe we're saying the same things just with sort of different different words uh, but it seems to me that the real risk is deflationary, that there's an inflationary shock, but that that is the thing that tips everybody over the edge and everybody realizes actually the economy is not good and trade has been shrinking and this Chinese deflation is finally going to get exported everywhere. And really, like it's going to be demand destruction because everybody's going to wake up and realize that there's all this volatility and like and the very thing that gives Trump the kind of negotiating power that you're talking about will cut against him because yeah. Whether he's rational or not, like it all, there's an era of um, an aura of complete volatility to him. He'll wake up one day and say one thing; the next day he'll say something else. That works if you're the one who's controlling the negotiation. But if, if the very, if your very presence has set off a panic in some sense and has people running for the hills, and maybe not for bonds, maybe that, like you know, I'm hearing all the time, like maybe they're running for gold, or maybe it's running for commodities, or maybe it's running for crypto. But like all these alternate asset classes, you know, you start looking at it. So, so listen, you know. that is the point. We don't have to have any real agreement on a lot of things. What we're really agreeing is that where where Trump is a real paradigm shift is that long term inflation expectations have to rise, and they haven't. Hmm. You know, they haven't. At least not through surveys, not five year, five year forward, not the expectations through the surveys like Michigan and so on. And I think this is the most mispriced macro chart. And gold is sniffing this out. If gold has completely uh, dislodged itself from long term, um, long term real yields, which is the ten year yield deflated by long term inflation expectations. And that tells you that whoever's buying gold right now, whoever's bidding it up, is doing so because they don't believe long-term inflation expectations. And I think those people are right. Now, just to be clear, Jacob, gold has been massively wrong in the past. Remember 2008, 9, 10? Mm -hmm. You and I were working yeah. together. And at the time, what happened? Everybody thought inflation would go up. Gold went up initially because of QE, and then it collapsed. This time around, I think we're in a different macro setup. There's been a lot of fiscal power. Politics and geopolitics is inflationary, whereas disinflationary there. And so I think that gold is correct. 
Um, but it will be interesting to see. But listen, let's talk about one thing. Uh, if I well, can just hold on. Marco, just, yeah. just one second before we talk about this thing. I just because I've picked up a lot of farmers and agricultural listeners um, on my travels the last couple of months, and I just want to say right here, if you're listening, this is one of the reasons when I speak to you to those audiences, I show you the chart of what farm real estate looks like over the past couple of years, and why Bill Gates is buying all the farmland, and why everybody else loves it, because the same things that we're talking about with gold and crypto go for your land. And people and governments are going to want that land. So like, you should be thinking about that in general. It's not abstract when I talk about that. So take it from there. No, thanks for interjecting that. I'm actually going to speak with some farmers in Idaho and uh, in like a couple of weeks. So uh, that's a great point. I, I wanted to just go back because, you know, there's two things we're talking about here, Jacob. You asked great, but there's also geopolitics, right? So NATO, mm -hmm. Japan, China, um, Iran, Israel. On that front... Uh, you know, I'm just going to give you my view very short. I think Trump is the best thing for world peace um, in a very long time. I'm going to just like lay it out there. Go. I think he's the best possible thing for a thesis you both and I share, which is the emergence of a multipolar world. Like, uh, I, I feel like the thesis actually runs into some problems if you get a Biden re-election and the U.S. and China continue on their soft Cold War trajectory and, you know, Europe pussyfoots around and doesn't actually put on its big boy pants and help Ukraine. Um, but I, it feels to me like if Trump enters the White House again, Europe gets set off on a completely new course. Um, Japan, you've already seen signals. I mean, the most interesting thing about the Japanese visit to the White House last week, Kashida's visit to, to with Biden, was that, you know, the New York Times was saying things, White House, White House officials wanted to create a sense of permanence in the relationship because they didn't want anyone to be able to overturn it in the future. I was like, oh, like Biden's thinking that Trump's going to win and he's going to completely upend the U.S.-Japan relationship. South Korea should be super worried. Like, I think Trump means what he says when he would think about withdrawing troops from South Korea. Um, so I don't know. You, you just go down the list. I mean, it, it, sure, it, it accelerates a multipolar world. And if you are with Hans Morgenthau and you think that multipolarity leads to more peaceful worlds because there's more balancing against each other, yeah, sure, maybe we can get there. Oh, I didn't but, mean it that way. No, for sure. No, no, no. I, I meant like really... <laughs> like meaningful conflict you know like sustainable but look let me give you the counter to that i think there's two things that i i think maybe we disagree i mean first of all in my view multipolarity is a fait accompli and maybe this reveals just my deep bias methodologically philosophically as a realist you know so i i think multipolarity is definitely influenced by action and perception and ideology yes and domestic politics so isolationism in the u.s can withhold its power you cannot ignore domestic politics. You cannot uh, ignore norms and constructivism. Um, I'm getting a little geeky here, but That's I why do we think. Have you. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. No one accuses me of being uh, uh, anything but a nerd. Uh, but let's listen. Uh, to me, to me, the the thing that I I really do think there's objectivity to this, and it is a material reality that's difficult to counter. And I think um, the problem with the Joe Biden administration is that it hasn't really successfully enforced credibility in the U.S. And, you know, uh, for example, I, I showed this chart of Iran's nuclear enrichment, which is hilarious chart. Uh, literally, they go from zero kilograms of 20% enriched uranium to like over 600 only during the Biden administration. They, they just don't care. They didn't do it even after Trump took away JCPOA. They waited while Trump was in power. So Biden puts it down to zero. Sorry, Obama puts down to zero because they make the deal. Trump withdraws from the deal and Iran hesitates. Iran hesitates from um, restarting its enrichment while Trump is in power. And they only restart in earnest stockpiling 20% uranium uh, after Biden is elected. And so that's just one example. I think what Trump knows how to do correctly is he i think knows how game theory works and he understands that in order to um in order to avert crises you actually have to be extremely aggressive and he's done that numerous times for example when he was elected there was this chemical attack by syria which caused about 87 civilian casualties this was like february of 2017 something around there don't quote me on the date and it was completely meaningless. Like, it made no sense why Bashar al-Assad did that. And I suspect, completely suspect conspiracy theory, I suspect that Tehran and Moscow wanted to test 
you know, Trump's metal. And they said, hey, let's see what, how he reacts. But he, does he react like Obama? And of course, let the red line, you know, no, he didn't do anything. Yeah. And Trump immediately launched 57 Tomahawk missiles at a, at a base where Russians were, were housed. Now, he hit like the same barracks, you know, like I'm sure that he called the Russians and said, hey, I don't want to kill you guys. But he reacted militarily. Uh, similarly, ahead of negotiations with North Korea, he dropped the mother of all bombs on Afghanistan completely unnecessarily. It was never used in combat, but just to be like, I've got a bigger button. And my point is like, this displays to the CFR society and cocktail parties, they seem prudish and childish and, and you know, like, like barbarian. But unfortunately, unfortunately, and this is where I agree with, you know, the, the tragedy of great power politics, unfortunately, these displays are part of establishing credibility that actually then allows you to uh, defend your interests and actually preserve peace. And so that's the one thing that I think Trump gets, and he probably got that from real estate, the negotiations or whatever. The second thing is I think he's all talk when it comes to a lot of alliances. I mean, he had a chance to prove that he's a true isolationist, Jacob. But like, you know, I listened to Stephen Bannon give an interview in ITV recently. It was a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. And here's a guy who's like as uh, the most anti-establishment person that Trump probably associates himself with. Mm-hmm. And he gave an interview and said, look, we want NATO to go from being a protectorship to an alliance. We just want everyone to pay. And this was, again, this was a great opportunity for Stephen Bannon to go further and say, no, we want to withdraw America from Europe. Like, just say, like, you know, why stick to basically a meaner version of Obama's 2% target, which Obama basically sold to the Europeans. Like, that's what Stephen Bannon just said it in a meaner way. Like that was it. So I don't know. I, I don't I don't see Trump being um really I, I he's not going to strengthen multipolarity, although I, I agree with you he will. It's more like he will simply breathe it into existence for people who believe that it's not there. But it's not like Joe Biden's really standing against it. The other issue on Ukraine, look, I mean <laughs> look, what do you want me to say? You know, you and I have been on this podcast for a long time, and I said this war was over 18 months ago. I said, you know, this war is not going to move. The borders have not changed at all. The Ukrainian offensive was a figment of Western imagination. The Russian re-offensive is mildly successful. They're throwing, I mean, it's the weakest IR, uh, like, uh, return uh, on investment, R-O-I-O, ever. You know, like, I mean, uh, so the war is in a stalemate and somebody just has to explain to Zelensky, like, look, no amount of weapons or money is going to change this reality. Okay. Offensive technology has not caught up with advances in defensive technology. You don't have the people to reconquer these territories. The best thing for Ukraine right now is to adopt an Azerbaijan plan, which is accept what's going on. Don't recognize it. Spend the next 20 years integrating with Western economic development, get all the military tech you need, and then in 2040, reconquer your territories. I mean, this is exactly what Azerbaijan did. They lost the war to Armenia in the early 90s. They lost Nagorno-Karabakh. They spent the next 20 years developing their military technology, buying, you know, sophisticated military systems. And then in 2020, under the cover of the pandemic, where most people were not focusing on this, they reconquered Nagorno-Karabakh. Like, it is absolutely insane, in my view what the Europeans and the Americans are doing on Ukraine. I mean, they either don't care about Ukraine and just simply want to bleed Russia, which I guess has a geopolitical logic. Mm -hmm. Although I don't understand why Kiev is going along with that logic. Or or they're simply stuck in sort of this, again, you know, like just conventional polite society where you're not allowed to speak freely and say, guys, this conflict is over. No one's moving. Nobody's moving. I, I said that on your podcast, I mean, almost, I think, 18 months ago. It ha- the territories haven't moved. They're stuck where they are. And throwing more money at this problem is not going to make it better. And so I think like, that's another example where, you know, Donald Trump doesn't actually change anything. He just speaks into reality, which is a, what is all, already objectively true. And he's going to show yeah. up and tell Zelensky, hey, buddy, no more money. Move on. Focus on economic development and integrating with the West. Uh, and I don't think he abandons Ukraine. I don't think he hands it to Russia. He simply says, we're not going to finance this war. And then he probably shows some display of power to Putin in some crude, 
mean way that Joe Biden wouldn't. And, you know, tells Putin, like, okay, you know, for the time being, you got what you got. And we're going to take the rest of Ukraine and integrate it into Europe and see where they are 20 years from now. And you know what? We're probably going to come back and kick your successor's ass. So just FYI. Um, there's a couple things there, and then we have to, to move it along because there's a, there's some charts I wanted to talk about, and we have to talk basketball, and we only have 20 minutes. Um, first of all, I um, you think multipolarity is a fait accompli. I would say that the end of unipolarity is certainly a fait accompli, and I certainly think multipolarity is the most likely scenario, and it's the one that I talk about. I don't think that a bipolar U.S.-China world is off the table, um, and I don't know how many countries you have to have until you get to multipolarity. Like what if it's the US, India, and China? Is that tripolarity? Is that multipolarity? I don't know. So like there, I, I certainly think it's the right, um, I think it's the right trajectory, but like I could imagine things happening that would send off into bipolar trajectories or tripolar trajectories and things like that. Um, the second thing I would just say is um, about uh, Trump's negotiating style and the bombs and stuff like that. <laughs> that's a, that's, I mean, some very rose tinted glasses there. I think you need to go back and watch Dr. Strange love and, uh, and feel the other side of that argument. Cause it feels a lot more like Dr. Strange love than it does like some brilliant guy who like, Oh, I know how to hit him. And then I'm going to get what I want. Um, and again, I'm, I'm thinking of a Trump in a second administration surrounded by sycophants. The establishment, you're right, doesn't want anything to do with them. You remember ambassadors and career State Department officials all resigned in mass, positions that still haven't been filled. It's one of the reasons I think the bureaucracy moves even less well than it did before. And if you get another exodus like that, like it's going to be fanboys. It's not going to be people like the establishment's not going to be there that. holding them back. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and Ukraine, you're right. Like I, I've said over and over again, um, Ukraine is Europe's problem. Like it's not the United States' problem. The United States is going to run out of energy, whether it's Biden um, or Trump. And I don't think it makes that big a deal to, to Zelensky. Um, it's funny. Somebody already told Zelensky what you're saying. Zeluzhny did, and Zeluzhny yes. got fired. No, so did Klitschko. <laughs> so did Klitschko. By the way, Klitschko yeah. did as well. And I mean, there's a lot of opposition within Ukraine. Their, their united front is over. I mean, they could barely yeah. pass a mobilization bill, by the way. I'm yeah. sorry. Time out. Time out. That tells me the war is not existential to Ukraine. Don't don't tell me about World War Three odds, Mr. Prime Minister of Ukraine. Don't tell me that when you guys can't mobilize. Like, first of all, if there's an existential war, everyone 18 and up goes to war, period. The yep. end of story. Throughout human history, if there's an existential conflict, everyone 18 and above and sometimes 14 and above goes and fights a war. So, like, this is all you need to know. But, like, one thing I would counter... I mean, I'm not going to get a Connor. I'm just going to throw it out. I've had very much the same view as you did, Dr. Strangelove. That point. So I've changed my view a little bit on this, you know? Uh, and just because I am bathed in complete nihilism. And so when the facts kind of go against me, I'm like, what do I mean? We don't have a lot of data points. So I'm not going to say this is empirically like foolproof. But since Carter... Trump is the first president that didn't start a new war, expand an existing war. I mean, this was an analysis done by Reuters, not exactly, you know, Breitbart. Reuters went out to try to fact check because America, uh, Trump supporters say he didn't start any wars or, or, you know, expand them. And Reuters went out and was like, mm, you know what, that's correct. And so it's not enough to convince you. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm just saying but that when you study game theory, you, you realize that there's three components to power. There's three components to power. Material power is one of them. Fine. But U.S. lost the war in Vietnam. Russia mm -hmm. kind of got its butt kicked in Ukraine, more or less. Like, countries with material power do lose wars. Why? Because of willingness to incur pain and credibility. Credibility that you're willing to, to incur pain. And what I think is very, very important is that I think that the establishment around Biden has lost its understanding of those game theoretical precepts, whereas the, you know, like Trump has not. And that's where I think that I think Joe Biden, Jake Sullivan's of the world have not correctly illustrated to the rest of the world that the U.S. is willing to incur pain. And that it has the credibility to do so. Yeah. Also, I think it's very dangerous. And this is the last thing I'll say about this. It's very dangerous what the U.S. is doing with China. 
why Donald Trump showed up to China and had a list of demands. You know? Joe Biden's never given China a list of demands, ever. And so the Chinese right now believe that Donald Trump has a plan for how they coexist. It's mean, it's expensive, and they're going to try to fight him on it. But they believe Joe Biden has no plan for how they coexist, and his plan is simply to make it difficult for China to, you know, achieve its dream of being like a high-income society. And so who is more likely to start a World War III with China? And I have to tell you, Jacob, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this because in 2017, I did have a different view. I thought, man, Trump, biggest risk to bring us World War III ever. But I actually think it's not Trump. So, Yeah, I mean, I don't think the risks of World War III are particularly high at all. I mean, he started a, he started a trade war with China. So that's a war. The only reason he didn't start a war with Venezuela was because of how completely incompetent the whole plan was. But he tried. He tried to overthrow the Venezuelan government, like with Guaido. So, but you know, I I, I take your point. Um, all right, we've got fifteen minutes, and we've got a few things to do here. Let's do um, it. So let's do let's do this really quickly, and then let's give us give ourselves at least ten minutes of basketball. I sent you a chart from um, Louis Gav, who is great. Um, he put out a new. Uh, thing recently that I thought was really, um, really interesting. I took one slide from his deck. We'll put it in the show notes, listeners. But he had the 10 largest companies in the world by market cap um, for the last couple of decades. So the 1980s, he calls peak oil. And it's basically Exxon, Standard Oil, Schlumberger, Shell, Mobil, all that. There's some IBM, AT&T, basically all US names, by the way. The 1990s, it's a sea of Japan. It's the Bank of Tokyo. It's the Industrial Bank of Japan. It's Toyota. It's really interesting to see that those are the ones that are in. It's perfectly timed, too, because, of course, Japan crashes a year later. 2000 is interesting. You've, it's, you've got the dot-com bubble stuff happening. So Microsoft is top. Cisco is up there. Intel. Still some ExxonMobil, things like that. 2010 looks like a multipolar world. You've got ExxonMobil, PetroChina, BHP from Australia, Petrobras is in there, Royal Dutch Shell, even Nestle from Switzerland. It's like a very multipolar look. And then for 2021, it's basically all U.S. tech companies and TSMC and Tencent. Um, and he, his point here is that pro, like for the last 10 years, the U.S. has been outperforming and that probably we're going to shift to global outperforming the U.S., which is something I agree and we've been talking about for a long time. Um, but that also there's probably going to be a new theme. It's probably not just going to be tech is going to deliver growth for the next 10 years that it has before. Maybe it will. I don't know. But I sent you that chart and I know you have a chart that you want to talk about. So tell me what you thought of Louis's point and um, tell me the rejoinder. Well, my problem with Louis is that I see really no daylight between me and him. We're like the same <laughs> person. You know, I mean, I, I know him. Uh, I've, I've been at events with him before, and, and I almost always find um, a lot of commonality with his with his views, you know? So I, I agree with this. It's um, And I, I'll say this. I mean, I have a lot of folks managing a lot of money coming into my office and saying things like, Marco, tell me why I should ever invest anywhere outside of the U.S. Hmm. And my answer is because the nine other guys and gals that came into the office before you said the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, and so this isn't about like, you should take your exposure to US from 60% to 40, but maybe start nibbling at the rest of the world. And my chart that I brought to you is global pools of capital, you know, going out to 2060, I think. Um, and what it shows is that not Chinese, not petro states, not America, not Europe, not Japan, but global South as a global pool of capital is increasing. Now, this doesn't mean that global South is not going to plow into American assets if they're better performing. But I do think that there is some home bias in that they, there's home nuance, not bias, but just knowledge. You know, And I think that that's why another reason that we need to be cognizant of as investors is that it's not about what Americans want to do with their savings. It's also what the rest of the world wants to do it. And for the past 10 years, it's been very lucrative to be in the U.S. But a lot of things that we've been talking about on this podcast for the last 18 months suggest that, yeah, you should start nibbling at opportunities elsewhere. I agree 100% with Louis. Yeah, and I mean, a couple of the, the facts that he put in the, the, next, uh, the next slide were U.S. equities account for 7% of the global equity market cap. The U.S. is roughly 18% of global GDP and under 4% of global population. And he asks, can 18% of global GDP really account 
for 70% of global profits for the coming decade. And I was debating this with a, an advisor friend of mine actually just today um, on, on the plane. And you know, he, was, he was sort of like that person that you're talking about saying, ah, hmm. I, I only feel good in the US. And I was like, well, I don't know. If I were you, I'd be, I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying that a, a whole world X US index is maybe the right way to go about it. I'm like, I want to load up the dump truck for Brazil. I want to load up the dump truck for, for, for Mexico. There's some India and Indonesia stuff that's super interesting. Turkey, like you have to be selective. But like when you start looking around. Well, you know, Jacob, what's the number one counter to this view? Because I have the same thing. I was just in Abu Dhabi presenting at an event and I had a chart, which was exactly that. Like it was uh, the rest of the world GDP and rest of the world equity market cap. So I flipped it. Um, and it's, it's alligator jobs. The number one counter is yes, but U.S. U.S. index, U.S. Uh, equities have higher profit margins. You know, that's the number one counter to this, massively larger. And what I say to this is two things. First of all, yes, because it's tech companies. Okay, they have higher profit margins. That's correct. But there's another issue here that we have to understand. In a world of low growth, low inflation, the secular world that we are exiting, the only growth you have is bottom line growth. Okay, you don't have any top line growth. It's a low growth world. It's low inflation. So you want to be in companies that spit out profit margins because that's the only thing you're going to get. Because guess what you're not going to get? You're going to get bottom line growth. You're not going to get top line growth. There is no top line growth. But in a world that's high growth, high inflation, high nominal GDP growth, you're going to get a lot of top line growth. So yeah, it's okay if European companies have smaller profit margins, but they may be more exposed to the high growth, high inflation world you're in. And they are. That's why tech companies do so well in an inflationary world. There's other reasons too. Mm -hmm. They're long duration assets, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, I mean, this inflation. You know, low inflation, low growth, you want to own a tech company. High inflation, high growth. You may want to own a company that has 2% profit margin, but it's TAM is enormous yeah. because it sells commodities or it sells industrials or materials. Anyways, that is the counter to the counter. So when I'm sure Louis, I'm sure Louis gets this all the time, you know? People telling him like, yeah, but profit margins of those companies in the U.S. are huge. And it's like, yeah, but two reasons. You can find top line growth elsewhere. And the other issue is what did those companies sacrifice by having those profit margins? Ask Boeing how that went. Yeah. Um, I meant for us to have more time, so we'll just have to do a part two. But we've got eight minutes before you got to run and maybe less than that because we have to make sure the audio uploads. So. I'm completely depressed about basketball right now. I was in Toronto for a gig and uh, watched the the Pelicans do battle with your stupid Lakers. And Zion, Zion was finally everything we wanted him to be. He was he was yeah. bully balling. He was eating everybody for lunch. He was back cutting on LeBron, um, and he was bring he was single handedly bringing like Ingram sucked. McCollum couldn't hit a shot. It was just him and Alvarado, and he brings them all the way back. Tie game, three minutes left, and on an innocuous layup-looking thing, lands wrong, and suddenly his leg hurts, and he's out. Nah, uh, I think you guys and, faked it. I think you. I think the coach told him in the timeouts to fake an injury because let, let's just be honest here. The Nuggets are the number two seed, but they are undefeatable in the West, and you guys got lucky. I, I mean, I consider well, like you're depressed. I think it's nonsense. You're faking it. You're faking the injury. Zion's faking the injury. Are, 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 are you I, are you predicting a Zion Willis Reed moment tomorrow at the second play in game against? Uh, he comes out against Sabonis and breaks Sabonis across <laughs> yes. his legs. Or something. Yes. And by the way, why are you sending Ingram? Why? Because he sucks. Oh, but but uh, oh, I, mean, I, I mean, I think it's he, a conspiracy. He's been hurt for a while, but it's a I conspiracy. Agree with you. Come on, it's a conspiracy. You know, this is a I conspiracy. Agree. I think you guys, uh, this is a false flag operation, and you guys wanted to lose. <laughs> You can take on the inexperience, and I mean, come on. Like, I think the entire team, uh, Oklahoma City Thunder, like, you know, like they're the thinnest team in the NBA. You know, like they're just gonna get mauled if Zion comes back for that series. Who's gonna guard? Like, I, I don't know. I just Lakers we, we are gonna have to, get. We eaten. have to beat the Kings tomorrow to even get into the playoffs. And if come Ingram, on. well, I mean, if we have no Ingram and no Zion, like, okay, like fine. But the... what what happened with Ingram? <laughs> I don't understand what happened with Ingram. He he's been hurt for like the last oh, okay. quarter of the season, and he was just working his way back. And I mean, you could tell he didn't have it. I, Got now, it. I thought like after Zion went out, I thought Willie Green made a mistake. Like at that point, it doesn't matter that Ingram's been cold all game and he looks bad. Like you don't have options. You got to get 
the talent in the game oh, yeah? and hope that he's going to rise. Now look how Jay Paul signaled uh, cuts <laughs> where there's no data. Was that a policy mistake or was it political? I think I think the NBA should investigate this. I think Pelicans threw that game. And now my beloved Lakers are going to go and lose to Drago. And it's going to be very sad to watch, even though, yes, he's a Serbian. But again, I, I bathed myself in the loof indifference, except I bleed purple and gold. So I'm going to be very disappointed that Drago is just going to eat the Lakers like a snake eats a frog. And he will do it with no passion and no love. And he's going to just look like he was eating a sandwich. You know, I was talking with a friend yesterday, uh, and we were talking about going to Serbia this summer and trying to play basketball in where, whatever town Nikola's from, and then also try and get on his horse racing circuit. Um, does that does that mean, um, I, I think you and I are probably going to agree that it's Denver in the West, and it's probably Boston in the East, and Denver wins? Is that is that what you're thinking? Well, I want that to be the case, even though I'm all agreeing today. Um, but, uh, no, I listen... Uh, I mean, it's difficult to see who's going to guard Jokic. That's for sure. I mean, uh, no, they don't have anyone to guard him. But, you know, um, I mean, this this Celtics team is stacked. And listen, I, I'll just, I'll leave you with this, man. If the Celtics lose again in the finals, and if this is yet another year when they don't do well, I'm just going to say the curse of Isaiah Thomas is correct when they, you know, like didn't renew his contract after he got injured and everything that happened. And, you know, they just... If they want to get rid of the curse, they need to bring him back. All right, get, get ready for one of my hot takes. Cole, you're probably not listening to this, but this is the type of take that makes Cole absolutely lose his mind when, when I debate basketball with him. I would say fire up the camera, except the camera's been on the whole time. Uh, the Celtics are never going to win as long as Jason Tatum is their best player because he just doesn't have it. I don't think he has yeah. it, whereas Jokic does. Like, and it does, like, if it, it like, I just don't think Tatum has the alpha in him. It doesn't help that Jalen Brown no. doesn't seem to know how to dribble during the playoffs. And it doesn't help that Chris Stapps is probably going to get hurt and all these other things. But I think the key difference is Jokic, like, is going to be there at the end and he's going to execute. And Tatum is going to clank a brick from a long three at the very end of the game and he's not going to be able to take it home. There's my hot take. Not only is that a hot take, but you just like reverts the jinx to the Celtics. And now they're going to win the 18 champ. Thanks, Jacob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's the least I can do for uh, for hurting my boy. Not that you hurt him. He just hurt himself because he jumps too, too forcefully. Gets, get better, Zion. I hope that no, no. Marco's right. Listen, listen. I mean, speaking of your boy, like it's very simple. Charles Barkley's right. You can't play yourself into the shape. And, 25, and losing 25 pounds is not enough. You know? No, and and my hope is that you know what we've seen from Zion the last thirty games carries over. You got to hope that he finally got hungry, he finally understands what it takes, and that he's going to spend all summer not hanging out with the strippers and whatever else, but that he's going to spend all summer not eating New Orleans food and 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 getting ready to go. So you know what? I think we can end this podcast on that sage advice for all of us. Those two things right there. Don't do them. Don't do them. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And kids, kids don't do drugs either while you're at it. Okay. From, from, from cousin Marco and cousin Jacob, <laughs> we approve this message. Thank you, Jacob. This is always fun, man. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.